So good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this afternoon's webinar uh, that's going to look at integrated multimodal information for bus service improvement plans. Um, thank you for joining us this afternoon. Um, we are recording this session um, and you'll get a link to the recording afterwards. Um, so you can uh, remind yourself of, of what we covered um, and share it with uh, with colleagues and contacts if they've been unable to join us. Um, we do look forward to having some questions um, from yourselves. So please do feel free to use the chat function um, as we go along and we'll um, pick up uh, any questions um, at the end. Um, so I am Tim Rivett and I run Artig on a day-to-day -day basis and I'm your compare this afternoon. Um, I'm going to just do a few introductions and set the scene um, for you. Um, and then we've got John um, from MobiHub who's going to talk to us about the customer information needs um, and where that offer has been good. Um, we've then got Julian from Nexus Alpha who's going to talk to us about what they do with rail and bus information. Um, and we've got Tom from Passenger who's been doing some interesting things with cycling in their um, uh, app, um, bringing in some of the uh, sort of you know active modes. And then we've got Ted from Journeyo who's going to carry on with that sort of theme, looking at multimodal. Um, and active travel through on street information. Um, and uh, we'll wrap up uh, for two o'clock. So, for those of you that might not have come across Artig before this session, we're a membership body for public transport technology stakeholders. Uh, we've got members that cut across the whole stakeholder. Um, landscape from authorities to operators to suppliers and consultants and we um, work with uh, people like yourselves to help make sure you know what's going on, help educate and, and um, develop learning and knowledge. We also develop technical standards, um, so things like bus priority, um, real-time standards, information dissemination standards and things like that. And we work very closely with uh, government on uh, things like the current BODS program and accessible information uh, as examples. So um, you've come to hear about um, multimodal information um, and integrated information. Um, this comes off the back of um, the Bus Back Better National Bus Strategy, which came out earlier this year, um, and that um, makes operators and local authorities work together in a way that um, perhaps in some areas hasn't happened before. Um, and it um, tries and encourages a much more integrated service than we've perhaps seen before um, and it gives some of the levers to make that happen. Um, and it introduces um, bus service improvement plans, which those of you that are on the call that are from um, authorities and um, potentially consultants um, will have been busy beavering away. At over the last few months because you had to submit your uh, bus service improvement plans by the end of last month. Um, and they're really the first step towards the real thing in the bus strategy, which is enhanced partnerships and franchising um, and um, encouraging those to be developed. Um, and these improvement plans really are quite key um, because they're going to be how an authority um, gets quite significant sums potentially from uh, 
from the Department of Transport for uh, implementation. Um, and between now and the end of March, those partnerships or franchising plans need to be developed and, and put into place, as you will know. Um, and we decided to put this session on because um, when we started to see some of the early um, BSIPs coming out, they were talking about things like network and interchange development, bus cycling and walking integration, e-scooters, modal shift, transport hubs that bring together all the different modes, um, as well as um, private modes through bookable systems and flexible services and, and, and a whole gamut of different um, types of transport and ways of moving around. And when we started to talk to a few of the authorities that were publishing some of the early ones and said, well, what are you doing about it? Because we'd be very interested in hearing. They went, well, at the moment, it's just some words. and We don't actually really know how we're going to implement it. We know we need to be ticking these boxes um, to succeed with our BSIP, but we don't actually know how um, we're going to implement this and what we should be doing and what other people are doing, which is why um, we've got the speakers today, because they've got experience of actually doing this um, for real and providing these services to authorities and operators. Um, and so hopefully coming out of today, um, if you don't know how you're going to do some of this, you will maybe have some um, ideas about how you might move forward with it. So um, at this point, I'm going to hand over to um, John from MobiHub, who's going to um, talk about the, the BSIPs and, and the customer requirements in, in more detail. So welcome, John. Thank you, Tim. I'll just share my screen now and hope that that works. OK, um, uh, I'm a public transport consultant, been working in the field of uh, public transport information most of that time. I did the PTI website 25 years ago and have worked on the travel line and transport direct as well. Um, and I've been looking at SIPs essentially um, for a client uh, recently, but also to uh, look at what they're saying about mobility hubs and about the information uh, requirements uh, within those. Uh, I'm just trying to get to the next one, how I move down. Let me see this, sorry, I'm going to have to just reduce the- Just click on the screen and it should move. Right. Uh, oh, yeah, it is now. Excellent. OK, so what did um, us back to want? Well, um, it's um, sorry. No, that's the wrong one. Here we are. Uh, what it wanted uh, for LTAs and its partners um, to essentially deliver for passengers, um, integrate service patterns with other modes, make services simpler and easier to understand. That's a big theme. Um, and, of course, delivery of those goals to be reflected in bus information itself. Um, uh, we've heard briefly about um, bus service open data, the requirement for operators to publish timetable and running data. A big thing, a big theme within the guidance for um, SIPs was to make bus information complete, ensure that it's not uh, misleading, uh, make it easy to locate and to make networks feel like a whole integrated system. Uh, that's in line, of course, with transport focused research results. They have this document, the bus service improvement plans, what passengers uh, want. And that, of course, whilst it was published after the bus back data was produced, refers back to transport focus existing research. So bus uh, users need information at stops, both scheduled in real time, maps at some key stops. And of course, that uh, will not just uh, allow um, better information between bus services, but information across modes as well. And as I said before, key is simplicity. 
information that's simple to understand, simple to find. Let me just click. Okay. Uh, how issue? How was that issue of poor information uh, being dealt with in the BSIPs? Well, there's a multitude of BSIPs. I've counted 76 uh, with a huge spread of sizes um, um, of area and size of population from Rutland, of course, being the smallest population right up to Greater Manchester and transport for North uh, East England. But dissatisfaction with public transport information is often significant. It's around 50 percent, sometimes higher, sometimes lower, but it's still a significant issue across many authorities. And it is an issue across all, I would say. Uh, how have authorities responded in their BSIPs? Well, uh, some of them say, well, effectively, we have just one or two major operators. So we recognize it's a potentially a problem, not a big problem. That's um, some small, um, small in size uh, LTAs, um, uh, which uh, urban mostly, um, some of those are characterized by, by that legitimate response in their situation. Some LTAs are saying, well, we've had in the past quality of uh, good quality of public transport information. It may even be good quality now, but awareness of it uh, has declined, is not as high as it should be, and maybe the information itself has declined in quality, and that needs to improve. And then there's a third category, mostly I would say um, rural um, areas, um, those perhaps which traditionally haven't had a comprehensive network, they say we have a large number of bus operators and no clear unified network. We have to tackle this radically. And of course, there are some authorities that don't actually admit it, but you can read between the lines that public transport information is perhaps rather lower down their list of priorities. Still an issue, but not as high as others. Um, uh, but I would say that delivery of at stop real-time signs as a response is almost universal amongst all uh, service improvement plans. Its scale varies obviously depending on the size of the um, the, the area, the size of the problem, but it, it is there as a response. Um, what are some good solutions to dealing with poor bus information and dealing with poor integration of that information as well. Well, uh, one response that is nearly everywhere is a major, it's a program of RTI signs, and you can make that a major program, uh, signs at bus stops. Needed, why? Well, needed because the mobile apps may be unclear, may be hard to navigate, uh, and this is a, an important issue as well, may not be good enough to attract users away from social media. Uh, so that is a response of many authorities. And of course, uh, you need a program of those. You need a program as well to keep the information, the printed information at bus stops up to date. So that needs to go in the plan. And, and some authorities have definitely got that, not just an aspiration, but a plan itself. Another um, part of that uh, package uh, that appears in several plans is e-ink. Um, 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 dynamic or uh, electronic paper, if you like, which can be updated easily, but gives can give real time information um, without the expense that uh, might be needed to have a more conventional or older style, if you like, RTI sign. Um, one authority, at least, and may well be more, but certainly one I noticed is, is planning on totems. Um, and those are not just uh, signs or, or totems in the street, but they're electronic digital signs as well. So they provide or the capacity to display an integrated network or information about an integrated network. Um, another response is QR codes at the bus stop for a link to real time information. And um, importantly, this concept I mentioned earlier, particularly with, um, with uh, authorities that have a large number of bus operators, is one network apps or portals, which will give integration across modes as well as buses as well. Um, and then one, certainly one um, authority I saw had personalized travel plans. That of course can work if you've got 
a stable uh, information means so not necessarily a stable network but a stable uh, delivery mechanisms for for providing information uh, and that of course can cover integrated information or integrated networks works especially if you have a history of doing that you know the best way of dealing with that that response and you have um, a, a situation where neighbors will talk to each other and communities can share information but what are the future challenges um, well I would say ongoing maintenance especially of those major one network apps and portals is going to be uh, a significant challenge and fares information affairs information or lack of uh, integrated fares information consistent coherent fares information particularly between operators is um, an issue that BSIPs address. Once you get that information, you have to uh, be able to include it easily in, in apps. So that's me, thank you very much. I'll hand back to Tim for yep. the next session, thank, thank you. Thank you, John, for that um, and, and the background and some of the things that you've um, picked up from the basics you've been looking at. Um, so historically, when you talk about integrated information and multimodal information, um, you um, think about rail and bus, um, and that's something that um, Julian from um, Nexus Alpha has got a lot of experience in providing as well as integrating with, with other forms of um, transport as well and so we're going to hand over to uh, Julian now to, uh, to talk to us about um, what they've been doing. Hello, thank you. I will also attempt to share my screen. Right, a little bit of uh, information about myself I guess. I've been COO of Nexus Alpha Low Power Systems for the last 10 or 12 years, can't remember, it's a bit older than that the company, but Nexus Alpha Low Power Systems grew out of a small hardware division which was targeted at rail. We made, the company made information systems for rail, mostly software, but started then doing hardware as well. I don't actually have any graphics of any of those, um, but um, the first big for us anyway, installation was on the Robin Hood line when it was reinvented. And um, we installed screens, which were CRTs, complete with audio, which is actually how I got involved in the company because I invented the uh, company's audio system. But um, anyway, just to show you what we do a little bit of, um, these are a couple of screens in um, Norwich bus station. These were put up, I don't know, five or six years ago, something like that. Uh, actually, this is one, this is the same screen, but there are two of them. So uh, what you can see on the left is the normal display showing bus information, and it's obviously in the middle of scrolling up and down, left and right, so which is why some of the images look a bit odd. But on the right, it also has um, that section of the screen interleaves with rail information, which is um, not surprisingly the rail departure information for Norwich's main rail station, which is 15 minutes down the road. Um, just so you know as well, the uh, section at the bottom is a video. Um, sorry, getting some interference from somewhere, um, which obviously you can't see moving. Um, but also there are tickers on there. So that while there's no content on this at the moment, the uh, white line in the middle on the left screen is a bus information ticker and the uh, one at the bottom uh, can be whatever you want it to be. The red one underneath the rail departure, that will handle um, information which is sent out by the rail companies. So we've been doing this for a long time and the displays, um, these aren't even the first of them to do this, um, but we've been able to include that from the beginning. Now, let me see if, yes. Um, this is another uh, installation, although it's a 
graphical modification of another installation. It's on our website. As you can see there, this is the one which is um, in the middle that's taken from the outside of Norwich Railway Station. So that again has bus departures at the top because it's at a bus stop, that's its primary function. We then got some content that the council manages. Um, we can divide screens into any number of sections that you want them to be. But again, at the bottom, rail departures. So that's a live feed. Um, I presume that's taken from Darwin, but uh, we can take direct feeds as well. So let's try to go down. And that's it in situ. Um, the reason I put the, um, the other graphic up was this photo was one I took years ago on a rather poor mobile phone, and I'm afraid it doesn't come over very well. But you can see that it is there and it's been working for some time in the real world. Ooh, ooh, I think I went twice there. How do I go upwards on this one? Just, yep, that's it. Okay, it's worth, I mean, I suppose I should say that kind of rail information like that is in a sense almost trivial. There is a feed there. Um, it's very easy to put it into a database and to show it on screen. Our database is designed to be extremely Catholic. It doesn't care what data is put into it. Um, we can we use it to extract information and format that for the specific display. One of the things we use it for, and historically is older than our bus information displays, was um, disruption information and train crew notices for the rail industry. It's where our first displays were built and um, delivered. And this is because Nexus Alpha has a very strong relationship with UK Rail. Nexus Alpha was the original company. Nexus Alpha Low Power Systems does the hardware and has focused on bus. But I wanted to show you a little about the capability of the company to absorb and display information. Now what you see here is that um, we work, the wider company works with I think every single train operating company bar one, and that one is so small that it doesn't need information on its displays because everyone knows what's going on. We also take in information from Network Rail, um, TFL, as you can see, London Underground, and a couple of light rail operators as well. So we can absorb feeds from just about anywhere and use them. I don't want to do it that way. better. So there's kind of so much information that it's, it's very difficult to choose a topic to look at, but I thought it would be quite useful because, or perhaps interesting, because I know there's a lot of interest in um, seat usage on buses, um, social distancing, how busy a bus is, what's your service like. We haven't handled that yet in the bus industry. But we are doing it in rail. So here is a, uh, a view of actually an internal test system. This is live for um, Transport for Wales, but this is our view of it because some of the algorithms are still being developed. So here I set up a journey from Cardiff. I did this on Tuesday um, to Swansea. But I set it up for Thursday. So this is what should have happened this morning. I say should have because the way this system works, and I know there's a lot of discussion about how uh, occupancy is shown, is that Transport for Wales decided what they wanted was to basically monitor how many people are on the train and use it as a historical um, indication of what the train is likely to be because various people have tried Ica mirror for example monitoring wi-fi um, linkage not the actual uh, people who've logged in but just looking for the signals to see how many phones and whatnot there are on trains that can be used but it's a little bit flaky what um, transport for wales decided to do was to 
actually measure for real how many people were on trains, put that in their database, um, look, and there is some work going on in the background to um, kind of coordinate the way that relates to the Wi-Fi numbers. But what you see here is just the historical data and what you can expect. So as you can see, um, the colors are on the left. You've got little or no space for social distancing is red. And lo and behold, part of the journey, what's shown here between Pontypool and um, Bridge End, is extremely busy. The little green man is um, the station capacity. So you have put in, I put in Cardiff Central. So I'm going to be using Cardiff Central Station. I'm also going to be getting off at Swansea. So what are they like? Well, both of those in this at this time of day for this service are historically pretty good. You can maintain social distancing. If you want to get on the train, you're going to have a lot of space after Swansea going through Gowerton and Clanetley. So this is one example of the kind of things we manage, but there's a great deal more. Looking again at an internal um, dashboard for a new product called Arrakis. Now Arrakis is a new way of looking at rail information and providing it into the rail industry. So we take in a vast amount of data and process it and come out with what we hope are useful contents. Um, on the top left, you've got a CSL2 board. I don't know whether anyone's familiar with CSL2. It's basically the status of the service levels. CSL2 is sort of severely not working, if I understand it correctly. And at the moment, none of those TOCs have poor services. But you can see how that might translate to the bus sector. Below that, um, good old rainbow board. That is um, TFLs. Uh, we do a lot of others. We provide rainbow boards for a lot of talks. And as I'll show you later, we can actually display those on our displays. We already do, it's not a problem at all. Um, this isn't interactive, so there's no point in me pressing on buttons. You can also see bottom right there that we've got message options, and this is active messages for whoever is selected. I think that's covered by the, um, uh, the tab on the right showing who's in this meeting, but you can see that we have the content which includes delays in particular services, uh, safety and security message. We push those out to all sorts of places, including displays. So that kind of material from all sorts of sources can go to any display that we have on street. Uh, he is drilling into a little bit more de detail. Um, I've looked at the, um, well, the top one you can see there is a Wimbledon lifts out of order. You might see that on a display. But the one I've looked into there and expanded is a rail service from Leeds. And you can see that it gives all the details that you might need. Again, any of this can be pushed to a display. The, um, a lot of things like Wimbledon lifts out of order is already um, shown in rail stations to um, rail staff, not to the public, but uh, we package that up and send it out to the driver's mess rooms so that they are kept up to date with what's going on. The capability is there. There indeed is um, a rainbow board, which doesn't look like TFLs, because Mersey Rail um, decided that they wanted a very different kind of display. They had a, a third party design agency put together something for their, I can't remember what they did it for originally, but um, we had to sort of translate their way of doing it to one that worked on screen. So we developed this and obviously it's a traffic light system. Just so happens that on those they're all green, so you can't see any other colors. Beneath is the um, area which they manage, the Wi-Fi section, and in between is a message in the middle screen anyway, which is in the middle of scrolling. It scrolls up and then 
scrolls to the left as normal. If it changes route, it scrolls up to a different route name. Um, so that gives some of the information that is generated from the backroom systems that I was showing just a moment ago. And then I thought, right, okay, how do you display this? Well, on street, you've seen uh, that you can stick it on a TFT, that's pretty obvious. Uh, we do that all over the place. But as a company, and it's becoming more and more um, of interest, is that we do low power displays, which can be solar powered. So you've got a flag there on the right. Um, now you can't see the text on screen. Uh, you can see it in the central one labeled Norfolk County Council. It doesn't matter for us what kind of display it is or what's driving it. We can push it the same information out to all of the display types, except of course we can't show pretty graphics on a, a dot matrix display. Clearly that's impossible, at least a low res dot matrix display. So there you can see some systems that will run um, anytime, anywhere out in the wilds from solar power, except for the TFT on the left. But it gives you an idea. I mean, we're also working on, uh, we're about to deploy some e-ink. Um, we do what are normally called totems, although I haven't shown any here. We've got some of those due out into Norwich shortly. And um, we also support QR codes. Uh, so those are three things taken from John's presentation. Mm. Um, so anyway, as far as we're concerned, we can supply things like that to put information on, or if you've already got displays, you just need one of those. That's um, a media player that we produce that will link into everything, um, and we can program up to show any of the content on a third-party display with an HDMI, or if we customize it for some other output type. Yeah. That's it, basically. Um, so you'll get this later. That's my email address if anyone wants to talk further thank you and julia I will, I will see sharing i don't know how long i took there i hope it wasn't too long yeah okay no so thank you that's uh, a good insight into some of the things that you can do with uh, with with rail information um these days um there's much more to multimodal than just uh, bus and rail um, which is why uh, passenger have been um, starting to do things with cycling. We're going to hear from Tom now um, what they've been doing with um, active travel modes. Thank you, Tim. Um, just checking that you can see that on your screen. You can, brilliant. Okay. Um, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Tom Quay. I'm CEO uh, and founder at a company called Passenger. Um, the next 10 minutes or so, um, I'm going to be talking about, um, as Tim said, uh, so some integration between uh, micro mobility and um, bus information on the web and in mobile apps. Um, Okay, so just a quick bit of background on Passenger as an organization. We are currently working with about 80 or so um, bus companies up and down the UK, um, some of which I'll be chatting about in this presentation. Um, as a, a sort of mission statement, we are here to empower bus users to make sustainable mobility choices through integrated digital experiences, apps, websites, and more. Now, I thought it was quite interesting that as a mission statement, we have the word integrated in there. Um, and obviously that's the topic of the, uh, of the discussion today. Um, we bring an awful lot of different um, services together into our customer experience um, within our app products. So we, so we bring in digital ticketing, um, journey planning, timetables, vehicle tracking, real-time predictions, uh, disruption messaging, um, destination marketing as well, so that um, users can um, work out where they want to go before they know how to get there, that kind of thing. Um, and, and increasingly, uh, micro mobility integration, um, which is the, the focus of the, uh, of the conversation today. Um, so, promoting active travel to bus users. Um, I, I'm sort of casting my mind back to, to 2019 when this stream of work really sort of kicked off uh, within the team at, at Passenger. 
um, active travel was 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 less of a, a, a widely known term as it is now. Um, I think I picked it up at a a land or event um, at the beginning of the year in Bristol, uh, sustainable transport and public health event, um, where I was um, surrounded by lots of discussion around um, you know, walking and cycling as a as an active way to get around. And I, I'm not entirely sure that it had really dawned on me that that walking was was a was a viable mode of transport until that point. Um, that whole concept, and I think it was at that that show that um, I saw uh, someone present um, this this wonderful. Uh, walk the tube um, map, which was, you know, a very familiar uh, piece of information um, to all of us, um, presented in a in a slightly different way. Um, you know, you'll, you'll all see that the walking times between uh, stops on that map, um, and that really started uh, that generated a, a sort of conversation within the design team and the product team at Passenger about um, how we can change um, the way we display information uh, within apps and websites to. Um, make users, uh, the users of these things, um, you know, consider how they how they interact with the services. And um, so, subtle things um, would uh, create potentially huge changes in 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 the way that that information is is interpreted. Um, so, yeah, we started to look at kind of our own applications. I mean, this is artwork that I'm showing you now from from 2019. So some of this stuff is all, is all, well, all of it is all rolled out and has been for a long time now. But the, the, the design team came up with a simple walking radius around a location on what we call the explore view of our mobile app on the left hand side there, um, giving a real kind of indication of how far um, you know someone can get within a, a time frame. We, we included the number of steps that that, that time um, representation um, translated to as well because we were increasingly conscious of um, you know, sort of this narrative in the wider press around 10,000 steps a day being healthy and, and you know increasing adoption of wearable technology like Apple watches and um, and the kind of you know the the, the, the tracking that we were that, that society was generally trying to starting to do more of in terms of the um, sort of keeping healthy and um, in the middle screen on, on the right hand side you'll see how we introduced the, the, the step count idea to the journey planning um, results menus that or screens that we have in the apps uh, really starting to kind of make simple changes that give a nod to to the the health benefits of active travel within um, you know a bus journey um, and we sort of started to really kind of think about how um, these um, walking was extending the network and, and how other things um, you know like cycling and um, the, the sort of more recent addition of, of, of scooters were really ways to extend the, the accessible network for for users. Um, at the, um, the show that I referenced, uh, the, um, there was a company called Beryl, um, who are a public bike share or micro mobility, as they like to be called now, um, provider. Um, and we struck up a conversation um, about what they were doing and, um, and and what that was all about. And the the seeds of of, of integration between these two um, uh, sort of bus where we were predominantly working uh, quite heavily uh, and, and with bike uh, became became a sort of an active conversation. Um, Beryl were due to launch in Bournemouth in the June. I think the show was in the March. And um, the, the, the the sort of the, the area the network area that they were covered is, is shown on the map here and um, it was very much. Uh, sort of across the same area as the as the as the two main operators within the region that we have down here um for those of you not familiar with um a sort of a, a public um a shared bike um you simply um download a mobile app scan it on the uh, on, on the front of the bike in this case um obviously add your card details and that will bill you for um the time that that bike is unlocked and that you are riding it very similar <clears throat> excuse me with a, with a, a, a an e-scooter as well um the interface um, that they launched within their mobile apps was was really straightforward, um, really easy to understand. Um, bay locations and bike locations. So Beryl um, uh, initially in Bournemouth adopted a model of dockless bays. So bikes were simply um, needed to be returned to um, zones uh, rather than physical infrastructure to, um, to to be returned back to bays so they could be found by others. Now, what we, we started to do was um, Kind of appraise the opportunity to bring these two together, um, so buses and bikes, and and we looked at the potential to solve the first and last mile challenge. So getting to and from stops, um, I think there's a there's a there's a, a requirement to have a, a stop within 400 meters of every house or something uh, around that. So we were looking at kind of how 
um, you know, we might be able to solve the uh, the challenge of getting to those stops um, with these um, these new new additions to the network as we were seeing it. Um, we knew that from the work that we'd done, using multiple apps and websites to plan journeys can be tricky, particularly for um, different um, demographics of users. Um, in the background, um, and, and in 2019, it's very similar to how it is now, um, that there is a trend of usership um, as opposed to ownership. Um, so, you know, let fewer and fewer people are, are, are taking driving tests and wanting to own cars, all those kinds of things. So the adoption of, of, of shared resources such as bikes was, was an interesting one to us. Obviously, you can um, call um, buses a shared mode of transport just as easily. So there was a, there was a natural affinity there. Um, dockless bike business model was maturing. Um, so we could see that that you know there wasn't a requirement on physical infrastructure to uh, to roll these things out, and then uh, alongside that, there's an increasing community acceptance of bike share schemes. Um, we thought in this there might be an opportunity to create an awareness of alternative journey options as well. Um, you know, we were aware from the from the from the data we were collecting within the apps that not everyone travels um, to um, a destination and back again with the same mode. Um, you know, the, your your level of fitness um, has an impact on that. Your your sort of temporal um, condition, your tiredness, your mood, whether you've got dependence, are all um, really good um, reasons why users of applications might you know choose alternative modes or or, or, or would benefit from being aware of alternatives um, within the same um, the same experience. So you know, working with Beryl, as I say, we 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 met them. We struck up a good conversation with them. Bournemouth was their first deployment, so and so they were very open to learning at this point. Um, they were very uh, it was local to to passengers as a team. We're based in Bournemouth, so very easy for us to test this stuff out for real. And something you know, as a mantra for for everything we've ever done is to is to is to eat the dog food, test the stuff out in the in the territory, and and really learn what it is to be travelling between uh, different modes and and using this technology. Um, we also spotted that Beryl had a, had a really smart initiative to put their dockless bays very close to bus stops. So they, they'd identified that there was a, a first and last mile um, uh, thing here where actually uh, transfer between uh, buses and bikes made good sense for them. And we had a highly supportive local authority um, in the area in BCP. Um, so we approached um, all of the, the stakeholders. So we had customers um, go south coast and yellow buses. Go, so go South Coast, um, the more bus brand down here, and also the, the university bus for VU. Um, so, that, so I suppose having that relationship with, with all of those um, different stakeholders made this um, particular initiative uh, possible. But what did we set out to learn? Um, we were really curious to know whether our assumptions um, on, um, on you know, the, these conversations that we were having as a design team were, were whether they were valid or not. So you know, our key objective was to learn whether uh, bus users uh, found the integration valuable between um, bus and bike in this way. Uh, we wanted to demonstrate delivery of technology in users hands so um, you know we a small scope of work um, across multiple stakeholders we we knew that might be complex so you know demonstrating something um, integrating um, was 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 really sort of key to get that into production. Um, um, primarily for the team we wanted to really sort of extend our own understanding um, both of the technology um, and the user experience across the team of, of this kind of new mode that had um, uh, sort of arrived on our doorstep. Um, possible challenges that we saw at the time, and, and remember this is 2019 that we kind of wrote this list, um, was stakeholder coordination. Now, <clears throat> you know, as Tim alluded to earlier, not, not all bus operators are um, are used to working in strong co collaboration and that you know I think is something that's certainly changing with the, the arrival of the bus strategy and, and the BSIPs but stakeholder co uh, coordination was certainly something that we were thinking about at that point in time. Um, bikes may not, may, so on, a, on a practical note, bikes may no longer be available when you arrive there so when, a, when, you, when you catch a bus to a, to a bus stop which has a bay next to it, the, 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 the plan you might have made when you left uh, on your journey uh, may have to change mid Mid journey, as that bike or that asset is no longer available. Also, damage bikes um, not being rideable. We were very uh, mindful of of earlier bike share schemes, uh, particularly in Manchester and in Sheffield, in different places around the country, where there have been a lot of um, damage to bikes. Um, so perhaps they might not be. Um, that might you know be something that we we have a have to consider as well in terms of the the impact on the, the journey that was being chosen. Um, and as a result of all of that, um, you know, does does that integration have to potentially be uh, sort of removed at short notice because um, a scheme pulls out of a particular geography? 
Um, so just to shift, shift forward and see uh, the implementation um, of, of this into the apps and sites. Um, so I'm showing you now the sort of the original artwork. Um, this um, is our, our sort of our, our web site product, looking at what we call the explore view again, really sort of um, sort of mocking up how we, um, you know, how the, the, the what was already um, being kind of designed and, and rolled out to the to the conurbation here in terms of what was being displayed in the Beryl app. Um, we, we mimicked that slightly in bringing that into um, our own um, bus branded products so that it was consistent across the board so that you know someone who was perhaps interested in Beryl and had downloaded the app on on uh, on on the Beryl side was seeing something that was similar um, in in the bus implementation as well so that the users could kind of get a, a consistency across these different applications that they were perhaps using a minute um, Tom sorry uh, a minute left. a minute okay Cool. I'll fly through these screens then. So we we ran through the um, the uh, the apps and the websites, um, and we launched that in December nineteen, uh, December twenty nineteen, just before the pandemic. Um, as a pandemic response, we also uh, then took that opportunity to roll it out with Nextbike in Cardiff, who we also have a deployment with, um, and there was a great response there because it was really something that the the operator there was able to show um, in terms of a collaboration and a. You know, we are we are helping. We are looking to work together to uh, to make these journeys possible for you. Um, we upgraded the um, the implementation in Bournemouth to include e-scooter trials, and um, that were launched in January 21. Um, and you can see there that the information um, is coming through the feed. Um, so we did the same in Cornwall with CoBikes, um, which is also I think a white labelled uh, next bike implementation, and. Just to quickly go through what we've learned so far, technical takeaways, there's a well-used standard here, GBFS, public bike share scheme, um, uh, which um, is very easy to technically integrate to. Um, Micromobility operators are the provider and the technology team, which makes things easier. E-scooters have been added to the GBFS data um, uh, that we're being provided with, so it's all coming through the same feed. Non-technical takeaways, micromobility is growing in popularity again. Opportunity for bus operators to become a central part of the active na travel narrative is really, really huge. Um, visible demonstrations of collaboration are really powerful. Users see efforts to embrace new, new initiatives. Um, and we've been able to reframe that conversation to collaboration rather than competition. Um, last point on the, on the non-technical takeaways, fostering working relationships without commercial pressure is good for exploring the art of the possible. So it's been a really interesting stream of work to explore. What's next? With BSIPs, um, potentially there is an opportunity to bring in um, bike and bus into a single ticketing, and obviously then that would pave the way to integrate the journey planning as well. Um, final nod to the, the bus strategy, public transport should be easy to access via journey planning websites and apps with everything passengers need to know at their fingertips. And that is certainly what we are attempting to do. Thank you, Tim. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you, Tom. Uh, you've had a busy uh, couple of years um, <laughs> with uh, with integrating uh, micro mobility. Um, but uh, it's good to see what you've uh, been able to achieve on your app. Um, we're now going to um, go to um, Ted from Journeyo, who um, is going to talk to us about um, multimodal um, on street. Yes, indeed. Good day. Good afternoon, folks. So um, hopefully joining up a few of the um, previous uh, presentations and discussions, I'll, I'll start with a... So for those who... Who don't know is just a very brief um, overview of who, who Journey you are uh, and 21st century. You might have heard of two names in conjunction with one another. Um, Journey you are a uh, PLC. Um, within the PLC, you've got 21st century fleet systems and 21st century passenger systems. They are, are going to rebrand next year and all become under the single Journey you umbrella of Journey of Journey of Fleet and Journey of Passenger. Um, what they do, they split almost in half in terms of size and turnover, uh, each, uh, each doing uh, around £7 million each a year. Um, the fleet systems part of the business do on-vehicle technology. So um, we started off doing CCTV on-vehicle. Um, we do next-stop announcement systems, uh, customer Wi-Fi, 
uh, and, and more recently we've produced a, a connected vehicle solution. So all those different technologies on a bus can be connected back through a single secure portal for um, customers to, to manage centrally. Um, on the passenger side of the business, um, we, we concentrate on the manufacturer installation uh, and maintenance of real-time passenger information screens and displays hardware. Um, predominantly on street, historically largely for bus, although um, also multimodal as we're going to see some different applications as well. Um, so not just the hardware, but of course the software that manages uh, that manages that data. So um, when I started, uh, started with this business a few years ago, I came from a different industry. A lot of people were talking to me about different uh, data, different data formats different technologies, how we managed and blended that data and presented that to different screens and displays. Um, and I asked somebody to draw me a picture because I'm a simple soul and I like a picture. Picture paints a thousand words. Uh, and we've not done that before. So um, this was uh, our attempt following that to try and show simply uh, what it is that we do. So ideally one slide, well two just for just so we can see a little bit more detail of the next two slides, you'll see um, the capability of the business. So predominantly we have our um, content management system, EPI, it's out there in the middle. That's a cloud-based um, uh, web access uh, management tool, different profiles, different users, uh, levels of accessibility and control. And then we manage all these different data feeds from all these different modes of transport. So traditionally, uh, we take uh, scheduled transit exchange data and we blend that with Siri data um, and manage that through the platform and push it out to uh, hardware real estate. That's developed, of course, over the years with our customers. So we're ingesting data from tram, flight information, rail data, of course, taking in Darwin feeds, uh, and for a lot of our customers, APIs. So some of these different um, modes of transport we've talk, been talking about, cycling and things, we, we will take that, that API and ingest that, blend it together and present that to um, different outputs. So in terms of hardware, um, we will integrate to uh, legacy real estate hardware. So if you've got uh, existing LED displays, um, if we don't have, very often we have the protocols to drive those directly. If we don't have the protocols and those displays are well and truly proprietary, um, then of course we can modify those displays to make them non-proprietary. Um, we make our own range of displays. So I haven't got millions of pictures of displays though, Marie, um, but in a nutshell, we do um, shelter displays, 28 and 38 inch stretch displays. We do LED displays for those who still like the the brighter, the older dot matrix type of display. Um, we have evolved that. We do have a color LED um, range of displays as well. So you get a little bit more resolution. It's a finer pitch, but you also get some color capability for graphics and to represent different, um, uh, uh, if, a, if a vehicle is late, for instance, if a bus is late, you might show that in red. So it just gives a little bit more capability to those traditional LED displays. Of course, our core is TFT displays, uh, and I'm sure everyone knows you can do a whole lot more with a TFT display in terms of what you can show. So not just uh, data and text, but of course, uh, graphics, and videos, icons, um, advertising information. Uh, that's a, another key feature of EPI. We can actually uh, put advertising content or media content onto the screens and displays as well. Um, as, uh, as it's been mentioned, different demographic, different demographics like different technologies. So, of course, um, at the beginning of the presentation, we talked about displays being um, uh, safe and reliable and a good format for uh, most applications. Of course, anyone with kids like me will know that they just want to use the mobile phone all the time. Um, so we do, we do, of course, uh, manage that data out to third party um, stakeholders well, as well who might have uh, their own applications. Uh, we have our own mobile phone application, um, which allows us to present when you scan a QR code or an NFC tag at a bus stop, it will give you, I don't know if you can see this on the camera, it will give you real-time departure information to your phone. 
and for accessibility it gives you the option plus some tram interchange therefore so then audibly announced that now as well one forty one the next so step. that's one of our uh, accessibility options that works in conjunction conjunction with some of our hardware um, in terms of how that data is then uh, managed, uh, we tend to uh, work very closely with our customers to, to, to find and provide the best way to do that in an accessible and usable, uh, user-friendly manner. Um, each customer has slightly different variations on how they want to see, uh, to see that data presented. Uh, and very often we get involved in public consultations with those customers to actually see and try how best they want to, to see that uh, information. So that might be a, a simple case of pushing some of that data out to uh, existing hardware. If you've got existing real estate, um, that's actually a little, um, uh, the example, the middle picture there is an example we've done for a customer just to show them that how we could um, put cycle information, cycle count information onto one of their existing assets. Um, You'll, you'll notice that particular asset is by the side of a road uh, that's near to me. It's a very busy road and very often we sat in stationary traffic there. So it's a good opportunity to show people that there are possibly other ways to travel than sitting in your car in a traffic jam. Um, as I say, we work very closely with those local authorities to produce the different templates and the different designs. Some of them might want to have uh, via information on there or even operator logos on there. Um, but by presenting that different information gives them the choice, um, as has previously mentioned, gives users that choice to um, choose different modes of transport if they want, or even multi-mode of transport to get from A to B. So communicating that mobile data, um, this is a, a, an example of a scheme that we did uh, with one of our customers in the Midlands. Um, so we've provided interactive content as well. So as well as just pushing the data out, um, we do uh, uh, interactive browser content. Um, so we'll, again, manage that data um, from whichever multimodal source it comes from, uh, and then give that user the choice to um, choose which form of transport might suit them best that day. Um, so if I just uh, move down again, this is a little bit, this is an example of um, where, we, where that user can then choose um, which mode of transport they want to use, whether it by be by cycling or by walking to show them on the map the route they can take uh, and uh, i believe you, you mentioned earlier your calorie count as well it'll even show you how many calories you burn if you take and use that route so it's all about giving those passengers that that choice really uh, where that's uh, applicable of course uh, we've talked about interchanges and mobility hubs uh, so that might be from uh, smaller mobility hubs. Um, this is a, for example, this is a, a project we're working with a partner on at the moment. Um, very green, uh, low powered, energy efficient shelters. Uh, these shelters are in fact little hubs uh, for cycling. Um, this particular one has solar panel. It's also got a wind turbine on there as well. So ticking a lot of those green boxes for local authorities. But again, that user interface in there to help the customer choose which mode they might want to use. They might want to use the bus or the, or the bike. Um, and of course, larger interchanges where we're taking data from uh, your, your local bus services, uh, your tram, uh, might be your tram data, your train data, and pushing those out to those estates. So they're just a couple of examples of some of the uh, interchanges that we've done. Interchange, interchanges for us. Is, is, is quite a forte. It's, it's something that we specialise in because of that multimodal data capability. Um, there's been quite a few pictures of um, totems as well on the last couple of slides. Um, just to touch on that because we're seeing increasingly in lo local authorities as they're becoming more um, uh, aware of um, uh, budgets of course um, they might want to share budgets with different departments within the local authorities so some of those features like the wayfinding capability that, they want, that we offer um, they may well join forces with the transportation teams um, and, and on those totems have a mate so we might have real-time departure information on the screen on the top half of the totem and on the bottom half of the totem we might have interactive content enabling customers to choose 
uh, their favorite routes or local information, tourist information. Uh, and again, any live data and information feeds that we that we take. Um, is there anything else to say on that? So I would say, in a nutshell, uh, again, echoing um, right back from the head of the conversation, uh, I think it's uh, key for us in terms of the future. Um, it, it's about an informed choice for those customers, those uh, those users, those passengers, making it as simple as possible for them to use. So as many of those buttons we can press, uh, and as many of those boxes we can tick, uh, that's, that's of course what we're trying to do, manage that data and give the customer the best experience possible. So that's probably me, that was, was that a bit too short and sweet? No, that's perfect, thank you. Ted, <laughs> thank you for all that, um, and what's possible thank you. Um, on street with multimodal, so we've heard, um, on street multimodal from um, Nexus and Journeyo, um, and what you can do on apps um, with micro mobility and multimodal um, from Passenger. And John um, picked up on some of the things that he's seen in um, bus service improvement plans um, with his work um, about um, multimodal. Um, we are at two o'clock, so um, I'm aware that um, people will be wanting to get off to the um, rest of the afternoon. Um, so um, I would like to um, thank our speakers this afternoon for their um, input and the time and effort they've put in. Um, and I thank you um, for joining us and watching please do feel free to get in contact with um, any of the speakers. I'll circulate um, contact details um, along with the uh, slides and recordings. Um, and um, if you want to find out more about what we're doing or um, want to suggest some things that we could um, talk about and put on, um, on another session like this, then please do feel free to get in contact with me. My details are on the screen. Thank you all for your time this afternoon and have a good rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you for watching this Artig webinar. To find out more about Artig and our work, then please visit our website at rtig.org.uk. Thank you.